I turn that off. What is going on? Gateway Technical College. Right. Okay, we got the that blue circle of death. Something's happening. Uh oh, troubleshoot. You know what you could do in the interim? I'll read the textbook. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> what do you want from me then? Okay, it's fixed. All right, I'm connected. All right, here we go. Wait, are we recording? Oh, yeah, 51 seconds of nothing. Here we go. Ready? How does 75% of the blood in the atria get into the ventricle? Simply by changes in pressure. Mm -hmm. Say yes. 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 Then watch. Then the right and left ventricle, they're going to contract. Which one contracts first, the right or the left? They contract at the same time. Now, do you want blood that was in the right atria going back into the right, uh, uh, blood in the right ventricle going back into the right atria? Mm. So watch. There's those little chordae and the little papillary muscles. So when the right and left ventricle contract, they tighten up those chordae and watch. And the valves, the tricuspid and mitral valve, close. Watch. Who's watching? Okay, it ain't moving. It ain't moving. Oh, crud. Wait. Oh, God. Yeah, I know. Look, think it's fun for me? No, it's awful. I'm up here looking like more of an idiot than usual. <laughs> Okay, here we go. Wait. Wait. Okay, wait. Okay, here it comes. Ready? So right and left ventricle are going to contract at the same time. Bam. What happens? The valve, the tricuspid here, mitral valve close. And when the right ventricle contracts, it forces open the pulmonic valve or pulmonary valve. So the valve that separates the right ventricle from this little thing right here, this thing right here, this big vessel here is called the pulmonary trunk. And the valve that separates the right ventricle from the pulmonary trunk is the pulmonary valve or pulmonic valve. You with me? At the same time, the left ventricle contracts and forces open the aortic valve. And then the left ventricle sends oxygenated blood through the aorta and to the cells of the body. Say yes. When the right ventricle contracts and the left ventricle contract, they contract at the same time, the pulmonary trunk branches into the left pulmonary artery and the right pulmonary artery. Remember, right? A vessel that takes blood away from the heart is an artery. So in this case, the pulmonary arteries are carrying blood that is deoxygenated. And you have, watch, the pulmonary trunk. Then, you have the left and right pulmonary arteries. Yes. Then you have smaller ones called pulmonary arterioles. Are you with me? And then finally, What's the smallest blood vessel in the lungs? It's a pulmonary capillary. Are you with me? 
So that blood now, right, gets into the pulmonary capillaries and write this down, never forget it. Write this down, never forget it. Who's gonna write it down and never forget it? Vanessa, you're gonna write it down, never forget it? Okay. Every, if you get this tattoo, I will give you extra credit. Actually, if you take like maybe a sh blunt instrument and dig it into your forearm and it scars weeks later, I'll give you a, at least a C in this class. <laughs> Every pulmonary capillary is associated with a one, one cell membrane thick, thick air sac called an alveoli or alveolus, alveol alveolus singular, alveoli plural. You got me? And that's where gas exchange occurs. Tell me you're following this. Yeah. You with me? At the exact same time that deoxygenated blood is being sent to the lungs to get oxygenated and remove carbon dioxide, the left ventricle is contracting and sending oxygenated blood down to the cells of the body. Say yes. That's the circulation of blood through the heart. So remember, the atria work together. So when the at right atria is contracting, the left atria is contracting, and the ventricles work together. So when the right ventricle is contracting, the left ventricle is contracting. Say yes got that. So do you need atria to contract to live? No. No. Why not? That's right. 75% of the blood that's in the atria goes into the ventricle simply by changes in pressure. Yep. And you can do okay with 75% of your blood. You're not going to shot for it. But you can walk down the street to Aunt B's house and talk about your day. You can still run. Yes. So people with atrial fibrillation, they walk around, talk, and then dress. Oh. How many people got that? That's the circulation of blood through the heart. Which side of the heart pumps more blood, the right or the left? The left. That's very good. See, I asked that in my advanced class, drilled on her head, the left. <laughs> All right, now watch. I'm going to explain to you now the electrical conduction system of the heart. Are you ready? Did I explain to you the circulation of blood through the heart? I just did. Now I'm going over the electrical conduction system of the heart. Say yeah. Okay, here we go. Watch. I'm going to say this really slow. The heart is unique. The heart has specialized cardiac cells that don't contract. What they do is they generate electrical impulses. So watch. Do you need nerves from your spinal cord or your brain to stimulate the heart to contract? Do you? No, you don't. Because if you did and you were to transplant somebody's heart, you would have to transplant the person's brain and spinal cord as well. Then it would be a different person. It might be a murderer or worse yet, someone who didn't read the textbook. And then what kind of a life would you have? So this is important. The heart is able to generate, sustain, and repeat its own electrical activity. And it does that with these specialized cells that make up the electrical conduction system of the heart. Are you following this? Yeah. So hang on. Again, technology. 
to watch. Embedded at the junction of the superior vena cava and the right atrium, this guy right here, superior vena cava and right atria, is a group of cells that will fire at regular intervals. It will produce these electrical impulses. That group of cells is called the sino-atrial atrial, yeah, node, or SA node. You with me? And the intrinsic, normal intrinsic firing rate of the SA node is between 60 and 80 times per minute. So what's the normal resting pulse? 60 to 80, right? Because at rest, the SA node is going to fire and it's going to cause the atria and the ventricles to contract at about 60 to 80 times per minute. You're with me? Mm -hmm. Now, when the SA node fires, it will travel instantly over both the right and the left atria. Why? Because cardiac cells are connected electrically by gap junctions. And when that electrical impulse travels instantly over both the right and left atria, because of intercalated discs, they will now contract as a unit. Who's with me? Now watch. If you happen to go to the hospital, that's Spanish again for hospital. I know how to say something in Spanish. You want to hear it? Tesuda la nariz. You have a sweaty nose. <laughs> there was this lady that worked at the company. It could be 45 below zero. And she was, she called herself a freaking Puerto Rican. She always had little beads of sweat on her nose all the time. So I finally asked one of the ladies, I go, how do you say you have a sweaty nose in Spanish? So they told me. That's why I learned it. Anyways, two years ago, I said to her, I said, um, she goes, Tim, my stomach's killing me. Right? And I go, did you have a fever? She goes, yeah, how'd you know? I go, let me look at your belly. And she had a little bruising around her belly button. I, I said, you have pancreatitis. Oh, I don't. Yeah, you do. So she wouldn't go to the doctor, right? And then that night, the ambulance came and got her, and she had uh, pancreatitis due to pancreatic cancer. And she died to, uh, uh, about a year and a half after that. Really su sweet lady, right? Elizabeth Rodriguez, but sweatiest nose ever. <laughs> that is so stupid. That thing's zero for me. Zero for me. Yeah. Yeah, she, uh, she was really a nice lady. Right? I go, wow. Uh, I go, wow. Uh, what are you going to do this weekend? <laughs> she was a little short and tubby. She goes, I'm going out to dance. <laughs> Okay, this, <clears throat> this is a green fat line. Now watch. Do you want the atrias to contract before, during, or after the ventricles? Before. So watch. To guarantee that the atria contract before the ventricles, separating the atria and the ventricles are like, it's like a little rubber washer, right? It electrically, this group of tissue called, and it has a name, you're not gonna believe the name. It's called the fibrous non-electrical conducting ring. So it is a group, it's a tissue that separates the atria and the ventricle. It electrically insulates the atria and the ventricle. 
Let me simplify that even further. The electrical impulses that are generated by the SA node that cause the atria to contract, do you want those electrical impulses to then go directly to the ventricles and cause the atria and the ventricle to contract at the same time? No. So what prevents that electrical impulse that's generated in the SA node from traveling directly to the ventricles? The fibrous non-electrical conducting ring, or the furbinate curve. <laughs> you got me? So watch. Watch. With this fibrous non-electrical conducting ring se separating the atria from the ventricles, when the atria when the SA node develops that electrical impulse, it's going to travel instantly over both the right and left atria. You got me? That electrical impulse somehow that was generated by the SA node has to get to the ventricles. And the only way it can get to the ventricles is by going through the next portion of the electrical conduction system. And the next portion of the electrical conduction system is called the atrio ventricular node. Jimmy, we were worried about you. You're okay, yes? Okay. That's all I need to know. Well, I, I can't put everything in there. Why not? What? It's on that video. Okay, uh, who's following me? Who's with me? So watch. When the SA node fires, and it's uh, due to gap junction and intercalated disc, it spreads that electrical impulse over both the right and left atria. Yes? Mm -hmm. You've got to get that electrical impulse to the ventricles. So it will go into the next portion of the conduction system called the AV node. And in the AV node, there's a little electrical delay. That impulse sits there for a second. And the reason there's a delay in the AV node is to allow the atria to contract and push that additional blood into the ventricles. Say yes, you're following me. Then after that impulse exits the AV node, it goes through the next portion of the electrical conduction system. And that portion of the electrical conduction system is called the bundle of hiss. In women, it's called the bundle of her. <laughs> Ready? <coughs> so watch. Once that electrical impulse travels through the bundle of hiss, the bundle of hiss branches into the left bundle branch and the right bundle branch. Who works in telemetry? Have you heard of left bundle branch block? Yeah, yeah right. Yes, yeah, she can. Yeah. Did I tell you I'm going to be teaching a 12 uh, lead EKG course? Three weeks, three hours. Right? For free. I do it out of the kindness of my heart because I love you guys. Then again, I love boogers. <laughs> uh, I teach it at the uh, end of summer for uh, three weeks. And I will be able to teach you in three weeks, right, nine hours, how to read a 12 lead EKG with one eye tied behind your back. Not even planned. So watch. The left bundle branch and the right bundle branch. And the left and right bundle branch then further bifurcate and fasciculate, oh, that's on tape, into these fibers called Purkinje fibers. And when the Purkinje fibers fire, that causes the right and left ventricle to contract at the same time. You're with me. It causes the right and left ventricle to contract at the same time. So 
That's the electrical conduction system of the heart. Say yes. yes. Now watch. I'm going to piggyback that onto the little question that says, explain what's going on at each little blip, little bump. You should have on your card. Yep, yeah, I'm going to explain that right now. You got me? Here we go. How many people have heard, uh, oh, this person's in sinus rhythm? You can't well, cut it out. Normal sinus rhythm. You ever hear that? Normal sinus rhythm, right? So that means that the SA node is the pacemaker of the heart, okay? That's a good thing. That's what you want. Now, let me just say this, and then I'm going to explain to you how the electrical conduction system produces the EKG. Ready? Okay. What's the normal intrinsic rate of the SA node? 60 to 80. If the SA node takes a dump, the next potential pacemaker of the heart is the AV node. And the intrinsic rate of the AV node is 40 to 60. Can you live with a heart rate of 50? Yeah, you know, you ain't going to be leaping tall buildings, but you can, you can, you do okay. What if your SA node and your AV node take a dump? Well, kind of. The next potential pacemaker of the heart are the Purkinje fibers. And the Purkinje fibers fire at an intrinsic rate of about 15 to 30 times per minute. Can you live with the heart rate of 15? No. You would be like one of those clowns with the sand on the bottom and you punch it. It goes down, then it comes up again, right? You'd be like. So watch. When people develop a condition where the SA node and the AV node are jacked up and the Purkinje fibers become the pacemaker, they have a condition called complete heart block. Have you ever heard of complete heart block? Well, this is it. So these people need a pacemaker. So what they do is a pacemaker is a little bigger than the size of a Zippo lighter, and they put it underneath the skin, typically in the infraclavicular fossa, No, that was good. Don't you think that'd be a good name for a rock group? Let's hear it for inc in uh, I can't even say it. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so, and then what they do, watch. Then they take pacer wires, they put it through the subclavian vein, the superior vena cava, and they dig it into the right ventricle, our right atrium. Then they take another pacer wire, and they dig it into the right ventricle. And then they take another pacer wire and go through the right atrium, left atrium. And then they take another, boom. Does that make sense? Would it make sense, and is it possible for these cardiologists to be able to thread a pacer wire through a capillary? Do you need to pace? Do you need to put pacer wires in the left side of the heart? Do you? I would think no, too. And if you stimulate the right atria with the pacer due to the gap junctions and intercalated discs, the left atria contracts. And the right ventricle, the left ventricle contracts. So you only need to put pacer wires in the right atria and the right ventricle. Tell me you've got that. Now watch. What do you do when you get like a new video game or you update your Facebook status? What do you do when you get a new phone? What do you want to do? You want to play with it. So when people get a pacemaker, they want to play with it. <laughs> so they're watching Cheaters or Judge Joe Brown. And what they will do is they will take the pacer because it takes a couple weeks for scar tissue to form and lock it in. And they'll start twisting it underneath their skin. It's called Twiddler Syndrome. Well, why not? What do you got to do? You're old if you got a pacemaker typically, and what are you doing? Nothing. 
sitting on your fatty acid. So watch. Let's see, where is it? Where, there's a good one. Oh, here we go. So there's the person, there's the pacemaker, and then they twiddled it, they twisted it, and pulled the pacer wires out. So then I said, I don't feel so good. And then they got a little phone thing that they can call in to see if their pacer is capturing, and it's not. And then the doctors say, get your fatty acid to the hospital. we got to reimplant that pacemaker. What happened to the pediatric pacer? Was it? Is that what it said? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, this kid's jack. Look at how big that kid's heart is. I don't, I don't know if you know this, but if you look, if you don't, you don't know how to read x-rays yet, but you will, this kid needs to take a big dump. He's got a big turd right there. <laughs> that's, uh, that's why people require pacemakers. Now, some people who have really bad tickers, what they will do is they will put what's called an automatic internal defibrillator. It is a defibrillator that when it, it will be able to interpret a rhythm that's bad for you and will actually deliver a shock. Go ahead. And shocker, yes, yes. Um, she probably has a ve uh, her. Um, she probably has what's called sick sinus syndrome, and it, pro uh, it those people with that it has a tendency to put them into what's called ventricular fibrillation. And instead of the ventricles contracting, they fibrillate so that they don't pump uh, pump any blood. So if you don't defibrillate them right away, then they end up taking a six foot dirt nap. So these people will have those implanted, but they also uh, will implant an internal defibrillator along with a pacemaker. So the pacer wires will actually deliver the shock to that person. So like, what you talking about with the life vest, just a temporary fix until they go and get yes. into the heart? Yes, yes. You can't wear that all the time. Well, no. Hey, that. stand away, I'm about to get shocked. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Look, uh, I told you a story about the guy golfing. Anyways, there's two old guys golfing and me in front of my, uh, me and my buddy, right? So the one guy stands up, he's ready to tee off, right? And he goes, <laughs> and then he tells his buddy, he goes, I just got one. I go, got one what? <laughs> well, I got one of them internal defibrillators, just got shocked. I'm like, can we play through? <laughs> because if he goes down in front of me, by law, I have to stop, right? Because I'm a nurse. So they found out I didn't, I'd lose my license, right? But if I'm ahead of them, I didn't see him. <laughs> Do you know how many times I've stopped at accidents? I stopped at every single one of them. I do. Who said that? If they know you're a nurse and you didn't stop, right, you're in trouble. You are. So I stop all the time. And then people, they want to be heroes, and I go, you like, you got it? Yeah, I got it. I'm like, okay. You know. Did I ever tell you that story about the girl? I, watch. I was doing, just real quick. What? The one that was in the accident got thrown through the car window? No. Oh, no, that, yeah. Watch. Um. I did a preceptorship right before I graduated at St. Mary's, it's not St. Mary's anymore, and I was in the ICU, and I was working third shift, right? So I'm driving to clinical, and I have my Wisconsin baseball jacket on underneath my uniform. And right here on uh, Highway E, you know where the old pub and grub used to be? Mm -hmm. Right. There's uh, right by Parkside there on Highway E and, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, not 31, but Highway E and uh, 30th Avenue. Yes. There is, there's this accident. And it's kind of like a rainy, cold April day. So I'm thinking, well, nobody's pulling over, so I pull over. And I see 
this guy holding this girl in the middle of the road. And she's coughing, right? And it, she's all full of blood and glass and everything. And all of a sudden, she stops breathing. And I said, do you know CPR? And he goes, we're going to have to do it? And I'm like, yeah. So what had happened is two drunk sailors got drunk at Pub and Grub, and they hit her head on it. She wasn't wearing her seatbelt, and she was a human projectile. She went right through the windshield. Anyways, I had to literally piece her face back together in order to try to get a seal. So I'm trying to get a seal to get her chest to rise, and it ain't going up. So I go in there, like you're told, you dig, I start digging out glass and teeth. Still can't get her chest to rise. I have to pull out her tongue. Her tongue was severed. So I get her breathing, and then the ambulance comes, and they take her away, and then we find out later that night that she had uh, she died. Anyways, so this I'm doing CPR, and I, I hear, hey, I know CPR. I go, are you medical? And he goes, yeah. So it was my buddy who was doing his preceptorship in the same ICU. So he's doing the chest compressions, and I'm doing the breathing. And he looks at me, he goes, are you going to clinical tonight? I'm like, no. He goes, uh, pick up some beer and uh, meet me over at my place. I'm like, okay. So there's a store, it's not there anymore, called Lancy's in Kenosha. You familiar with it? <laughs> Anyways, I go in there and I get a six pack of beer. It's night, right? Are you following this? So I go in there and I get like a, a 12 pack or six pack and all these people are looking at me. And I'm like, so I pay for the beer, right, and I drive, and then I ring the guy's doorbell, and he goes, Tim, did you locate yourself? And I go, no. So I go into his bathroom. I am covered in blood, and I have pieces of flesh on my face. <laughs> and I didn't see it because I had, like, that red bla baseball jacket on, so I'm like, I don't see no And who, who's going to, oh, yeah, I just did CPR. Let's see how I look. Right. Yeah, that's a true story. And then I got called as a witness in the, the trial, and I'm like, I was sweating. I'm like, what are they going to ask me? Well, do you not do CPR? I go, yeah. He goes, well, how'd you know to do CPR on her? I go, she stopped breathing. And I go, you should write that down. That's where I got that line. I that <laughs> <laughs> but I felt, yeah, that guy did, uh, he did uh, eight years in prison. Wow. What's that? Yes, he yeah. I do have a question about that, though. If you don't stop at an accident, they find out you're a nurse, you can get in trouble. What if you have your family in the car? Uh, you, 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 I mean, I can't leave babies alone in the car. Look, you just take the baby like a loaf right. of bread and then do chest compressions. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, like, if it's obvious, it, right. I mean, it's like anything else. If you are a lay person, which now you got, once you become, you're not a lay person anymore, you can do pretty much whatever you want, and they're going to, like, you're covered under the Good Samaritan Act. But if I do something wrong, they're like, you should have known better. Right. Right? So that's what you do. I, I told you about the guy that got uh, uh, beautiful, I told you, beautiful summer day of driving home. I tell you the story? Oh, no. Anyways, real quick. And... I used to teach at a university. I ran a lab there. So I'm driving home. It's like 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Real hot summer day. You know how like around 3, 4 o'clock you get the real heavy storm and then all of a sudden the sun comes out. So when you just, I see this blue van piled, plow into this big fence by the cemetery, this iron, cast iron fence. So it's the engine smoking. I'm like, really? So I pull over. I get out. And the guy's got a compound fracture of his leg. Blood spurt like and everywhere. Right? And he's like, I'm okay, I'm okay. He had an empty 30 pack of old style laying around, cans all over the place, right? So I'm like, dude, you're not okay, lay down. I'm okay. So I take my shirt off, I make a tourniquet, I stop the bleeding, right? And then all of a sudden, I feel this tug on the back of my shirt. Get out of my way. I'm a nurse. Like this giant nurse ratchet lady. And she goes, I got this. And I'm like, okay. And I go, I ambulate home. I'm like, you want to be a hero? God bless. <laughs> that, uh, that's nothing. Nothing. You wait. You wait till you work. Like, if you work in an ER, the stuff that you see, right? It's just, it's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. Here's the weird thing about it. You will see people that they don't even look human, and they walk out of that hospital alive. And then you see people like, how is this person dead? They're pristine, and they're dead. That's the weird thing.
like guts hanging all over the place and stuff. Now I look at that stuff and I start to get queasy. And when I was younger, I'm like, oh, that don't bother me here. I told you about the time I had the guy's heart in his, yeah. yeah. The, the two guys that got shot, did I tell you about yeah. that? One guy came in, this is a different time. Guy got shot in the chest, right? And his heart stops. Did I tell you, and then the surgeon goes, hey, uh, do you massage, you're not a massage a heart? I go, yeah, I do it every Tuesday. Did I tell you that? So I'm on top of this guy, on the gurney, and I have my hand in his chest, and I am squishing on his heart, right? And that guy walked out of the hospital. Crazy stuff. Those, those nurses, oh, God, they were good. They were so good. I learned a ton. And those surgeons, man, like, if you watch, like, ER, and they don't make decisions like that. I'm sorry. It don't work like that, right? They would ask me, Tim, what do you think? Well, I don't know. You know, what, 25 years old? What do I know? I don't know anything, right? I just do what I'm told. But, yeah. I don't miss it. But if you if you like that, if you like you like that a little adrenaline, right? Then you go to the ER. That's the place to go. I had a friend who worked as a nurse in the ER for like ten years and finally told her, You will never get there, but you just have a little slower pace. Oh yeah. Yeah. But I'll tell you what, uh, if you want to get good at your skills, you work in an ER. When I first started there, I couldn't start an IV because I worked in the ICU. They never had to start IVs. Do, do you know who Charlie Waters is? football player, Charlie Waters, you guys are young. He was a defensive back for the Dallas Cowboys. He comes into Parkland's ER, he was cleaning leaves out of his gutter, fell, and dislocated his shoulder. This guy literally had pipes this big for veins, and I missed him three times, right? And he's like, find somebody who knows what they're doing. I'm like, I will, right? Because I thought he was going to kill me, right? And, but then after that, little babies come in, Tim, we need your help, right? I go on the foot, boom, right in. I, it was just like you could feel it, and boom, you go right in. It's a skill, and if you if you learn it, it's invaluable. You can like drawing blood. If you're good at it, man, you can you'll do okay. Because there are people who are really bad at it. Yeah. You know, and people who like dig around there. Oh, nah, you don't dig. That's ridiculous. That's why I say look before you uh, poke, right? And then here's a little trick, and you probably know this, right? Once you get the needle under the skin, you have that vacuum. Once you get that needle under the skin, you push the vacuum cleaner in, and then once you go in, you're going to immediately see that backflow. Boom. Write that down. Ruptured a uh, they ruptured a vein, so he's gonna have a big nasty bruise there. Oh, yeah. 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 Don't yeah. Don't donate. Yeah. 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 Don't do that. Go to the professionals. Call a cop. Tell me you got that, you filed that. How do we get on that, pacemakers? Okay. Intrinsic rate of the AV node is 40 to 60. Intrinsic rate of the Purkinje fiber is 15 to 30. So if you get into complete heart block, you uh, require a pacemaker. All right? So here we go. I'm going to explain now the electrical activity and how it produces the EKG. Ready? Here we go. So watch. When... When people go to the hospital and they have the EKG done, they put the little electrodes on them. And those electrodes monitor the electrical activity of the heart. So watch. What's the first part of the electrical activity of the heart to fire? The SA node. So when the SA node fires, that electrical activity is going to travel instantly over both the right and left atria. And on an EKG, you're going to see this little blip. And that little blip is called the P wave. And the P wave represents, in this class, both atria contracting. The little blip right here, the little blip. 
boom. That whole thing, bloom. This right here, that's the P wave, right? What separates the atria and ventricles electrically? The fibrous non-electrical conducting ring, the furbinicur, right? No, it separates them both because it's part of the cytoskeleton of the heart. So it actually separates the atria and the ventricle physically as well as electrically. So watch. Good questions. So when that electrical impulse is generated by the SA node, it travels over both the atria. What does it produce? The P wave. Where do all the electrical impulses then congregate and meet in the AV node. And in the AV node, there is a little electrical delay. So this little white line, and I'm exaggerating for the points of edification. Nothing. This is the delay in the AV node. Mm -hmm. Then the electrical impulse is going to travel down the bundle of his, and then the bundle of his splits into the left, and then the right bundle branch. And then finally, it will branch into the Purkinje fibers. Are you with me? And that on an EKG is going to produce this waveform. And this waveform is called the QRS. And in this class, the QRS represents both ventricles contracting. I, I have to say that because it's, I have to, otherwise it, it'll get messy. So if we were to come to your little three-week seminar and learn how to read an EKG with the eyeball size behind our back, we'll know what it is, right? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Now watch. What's your hope? What's your hope? What do you hope for? close. <laughs> Forget that. How about your to-do list? All right. Number one, study. Read the book. Read the book is number two. I'm not even going to write that. Number three is to have more than one heartbeat each day. That should be your hope. So watch. Once the electrolytes move, right, to cause the atria to contract and then the ventricles to contract, your hope is, is that the electrolytes reset themselves so that it does it all over again. So you'll see another wave, and this little wave is called the T wave. And the T wave represents the electrolytes resetting themselves in the ventricles. Are you with me? Now, why don't you see the electrolytes resetting themselves in the atria? That's because the ventricle, the electrical activity of the ventricle is covering up the electrical activity of the atria resetting themselves. That's why you don't see it. What's that? The electrical activity of the ventricle, so when that electrical activity is going through the bundle of his left and right bundle branch of the Purkinje fibers, at the same time that the ventricles are contracting, the atria are electrically resetting themselves. So the QRS complex masks the, the resetting of the electrolytes in the atria. Make sense? That's exactly how it happens. Now, in the advanced class, I'm going to teach you how the electrolytes actually move to produce the electrical activity, and then if you have electrolyte disturbances, how that affects the EKG. And I bet my advanced class, I said, I will be willing to bet you $1,000 and give you 10 to 1 odds that what I'm about to explain to you will come back and bite you in your fatty acid. Anyone willing to take that bet? And of course, no one was, because they would owe me $1,000. How many people followed this? Now, why is it called PQRST? Why isn't it called A, B, C, D, E? You want to know the story? There was a dude named Einthoven, and he figured this out. What he did is he put some electrodes on him, 
and he saw this waveform on an oscilloscope. And he said to himself, self, I think it that I must be missing stuff here and here. So I'm not going to it start at the beginning of the alphabet. I'm kind of kind of start in the middle. That why he put P, Q, R, S, and T. I'm not making that up. Uh, that I'm I'm being serious. That's why. Yeah. Absolutely, yes, yes. So cells have leak channels and sodium potassium pump, but cells that produce electricity have voltage-gated channels, and it's the voltage-gated channels that actually produce the electrical activity. Tell me you're following this. That is the PQRST, atrial contraction, little delay, QRS represents both the right and left ventricle contracting, and then the T wave represents the electrolytes resetting in both the ventricles. Say, yeah, Bob. The P wave is both atria contracting. So if this was to be on the test, all you get is a PQRST. Right, but you're going to have to explain what well, each PQRST what? means. And don't forget, everyone forgets the delay in the AV node. That's minus 10. Don't forget that. That's on video now. Hello? Yeah. Oh, um, what about the ST? Don't even worry about the ST. Don't. So we just need a P wave? That's wave. all you need in general anatomy and physiology. If you want to learn about the ST, then study the book called so I Want to Learn there. About the ST. You just want the That's it. Are you looking for a, a long description? No, just system? what I gave you. Just what I gave you. Just yeah. Can I show you something just real quick? I'm going to anyways. Watch. Watch. Who's watching? This portion right here, the end of the S and the beginning of the T wave is called the ST segment. The ST segment is very sensitive to changes in oxygen levels. You got me? So. If you're lacking blood flow to your heart, this is what you will see. You will see the ST segment depressed. That's a sign of ischemia. You ever hear those terms? Now, watch. This is what you don't want. P wave, QRS, and then you have the ST segment elevated. The ST segment elevation is um, a sign that you're having a heart attack. You got me? It, it's called the fireman sign. It looks like a fireman's hat. Or tombstone T waves, rest in peace. Or it's called ST segment elevation with convex blowing. It looks like t somebody's taking the ST segment and blowing it up. That's a sign that heart muscle is ready to die. So you don't want that. So study, read the textbook, and avoid ST segment elevation. Now watch, and I don't want to get into a big deal with this, but when they put the electrodes on your chest, each electrode is like an eye. You got me? So you got electrodes here and then here. So the electrodes over here look, with the hinge, look at this side of the heart. The electrodes here that they put here look at the bottom of the heart. The electrodes that they put in front look at the front of the heart. So based on the changes that occur in various leads, that determines what part of the heart is being affected. Make sense? Yeah. So when I learned how to read a 12 lead, and the, the doctor who explained it to me, Dr. Jeffrey Lakier, I actually lost respect for the guy. Because I thought he would pick this uh, 12 lead EKG up. That's an inferior wall on mine. I'm like, how does he know that? Right? This is a left anterior fascicular block. I'm like, how does he know that? Then when I learned how to do it, I could pick it up. I'm like, oh, that's a left anterior fascicular block. And then because I could do it, and I'm not that bright, I figured he couldn't be that bright. Because I know how to do it. But if you did a T2 and simplified, then of course, and it's 
show up at the Brewers and the ads. I'm writing that down. That guy, I'm going to tell you something. That guy taught me more off the top of his head than he will ever know in his life. I would carry a pad of paper around, and I would, he would explain stuff, and I'd just write it down. That's why I learned. That's why I learned from that guy. I didn't learn a lot in the classes. All I would do is sit there and listen to that guy. Him and Dr. Van Elk. Those guys were geniuses, man. One time this guy going to ventricular tachycardia. I'm like, Dr. Laker, we, we got a guy in uh, VTAC. So he called me Forrest Gump, right? And he goes, Forrest, lift his legs up. I'm like, what? Lift his legs up. So I lift his legs up, and he, his heart starts beating normally. And then uh, when I figured out why that happened, I'm like, that makes sense. But before I'm going to lift his legs up, what the hell is that? Then this guy had a really ra rapid heart rate, and he said, tell him to cough. Cough. So I go, dude, cough. <coughs> and his heart rate slows down. <laughs> Right, you bear down, right? It went that way. Yeah, and I can explain why that happens now. And I'm not telling you. You know why? So when I see it, I can think to myself, I know something you don't. <laughs> you know a lot we don't know still. So. Uh, you, you know what? If you knew how little I knew about the human body, you would be embarrassed to say that I was your teacher. That's a fact. Anyone who walks around and thinks they got it going on, they have at least going on. <laughs> For seven years, when I sat here, I thought, is tonight the night they come, security and, you know, the dean, and they take me out of here and say, you're incompetent, get out. I kid you not. Anyone who walks around and thinks they got it, they ain't got it. They don't know nothing. Because the more you learn, the more you realize, I have no idea what's going on. Right? You know who think they know everything? Paramedics. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, that's, that's my left clavichord. Right? They do, because they don't know much all they know is algorithm. Well, they you do that because of this and that, right? And you should talk to them. They're, like, incredible. That's because they're so Yeah, I know. I had a paramedic in my class, right? And he's like, oh, I know why you did that. I go, really? Why don't you explain it? He had no idea. And I go, well, why do you do this? Well, uh, I don't know. And I go, you're right. You don't. Shut up and listen. Well, no, it's not that. It's just that, watch, when you, know, when you know a little bit about something, then you think you know a lot because you think that's all there is to know. Do you know what I mean? And when you actually start learning about this stuff, it's like, I don't know this. I don't understand. What? Yeah, that's the uh, uh, electrical delay in the AV note. So it's a little exaggerated flat line. Does it have a letter? No, no letter. But I want that in there. You can name it. <coughs> name it Fred. Just put delay in the AV note. Okay. Yeah? Okay. We did good there, yes? Okay, watch. Yes. Oh, just so you know, the word of the day or words of the day for Terry, paroxysmal atrial tachycardia. If you say that to him, he'll give you money. <laughs> now, you have to say it correctly. And the reason I, you have to say it correctly is because he couldn't say it correctly, so I made him write it down. So he'll actually read it to see if he said it correctly. <laughs> Paroxysmal atrial, don't, doesn't that sound cool? I like this one. This is the best one. Paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. What's that? It really is. Yeah. But just so you know, paroxysmal atrial tachycardia and supraventricular tachycardia are the, basically the same thing. Did you know that? Yes. You can say either one and he'll give you money. I think you get 50 cents more if you say um, supraventricular tachycardia. Yeah. I'm just guessing. Okay, here we go. I want this whole thing. I don't know. What is this? Watch. I'm going to explain to you right now.
Is the heart muscle alive? Yes. Good, I'm definitely writing that down. Yes. So does it need oxygenated blood in order to make ATP uh, to contract? Yes. Good. Where does it get that oxygenated blood from? The coronary arteries. So the coronary arteries, you better write this down, I'm not writing it down. The coronary arteries supply oxygenated blood to the heart muscle itself. Are you with me? And on this video, I explain that I made for you, I explain where the coronary arteries are on that model. Isn't that nice of me? Anything else? You know what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a video of me eating a frozen pizza. It's not frozen. I mean, I'll cook it and I'll show you the process of cooking it. Okay, ready? Better write this down. The coronary artery openings originate at the base of the aorta. What's this? This is the aorta. Right here. What kind of blood is pumped into the aorta? There you go. So the openings of the coronary arteries are right here. What's the valve that separates the left ventricle from the aorta? The aortic valve. So watch. Here's the left ventricle. There's O2 rich blood in there. You got me? In order to eject that blood into the aorta, the left ventricle has to contract. And when it contracts, it forces open the aortic valve. So when the aortic valve is forced open, the leaflets of that valve block the openings to the coronary arteries. So during ventricular systole, when the ventricles are contracting and sending oxygenated blood to the cells of the body, the coronary arteries are blocked by the leaflets of the aorta. But what does the heart do? It contracts and relaxes. So when the left ventricle relaxes, the backflow pressure of blood in the aorta snaps that aortic valve shut and reveals the opening to the coronary arteries and will feed the coronary arteries during ventricular diastole. If you write, the heart muscle receives its blood supply during ventricular diastole, I'm marking your whole life wrong and half of your family. I'm going to explain that just like I explained it to you. You got me? Now this is important clinically. This is important. Can I explain to you why? No? Okay, fine. We'll just move on. Yes? What time is it? Fifty eight thirteen. Okay. How many people filed that? Now watch. 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 Who's what? Oh, no, now my thing went away. Where did it go? Oh, there it is. I don't know if I like this. Okay, here we go. All right, watch. Let's say, for example, that you were drinking, smoking, swearing, and not reading the textbook and you started building up cholesterol in your arteries, the coronary arteries. You have now coronary artery disease. You with me? Can you look at someone and tell they got coronary artery disease? Yeah, you can if they're going like that. That's probably a good indication. But you typically can't. Now watch, watch, this is the important piece. When does the heart muscle, the myocardium, get oxygenated blood through these guys? Diastole, right? So watch. These little lines here represent when the left ventricle is contracting. So in this little picture right here, when are the coronary arteries sending blood to the heart muscle? If this represents the left ventricle contracting, when are they receiving blood supply? They're receiving blood supply in between that time. You got me? So watch. 
If you're sitting on your fatty acid and your heart rate is 60 and you have blockages in your coronary arteries, even if you have blockages, you still have enough time to feed that heart muscle through that narrowed artery. But now you want to go and shovel some snow. So your heart rate's going to start to go up and your blood pressure is going to go up. What's going to happen to the time that the coronary artery is going to be sending oxygenated blood? It shortens. And if you have plaques in those coronary arteries, you're not going to be able to deliver enough oxygenated blood to the heart muscle. And when you lack blood to an organ, it produces pain. And in this case, you get chest pain. Tell me you got that. That's how a stress test reveals whether or not someone has blockages in their coronary artery. Yay! Yay! Tell me that makes sense. Yeah. Makes perfect sense. Um, I've heard that some of the symptoms for coronary uh, heart attack or uh, coronary artery disease, um, the heart is lacking blood supply is different between men and women. It is. Don't know why. Okay. I really don't. Women will actually uh, complain of symptoms more of depression or just not feeling right. And back in the day, got, most guys were cardiologists, so they would just blow it off, say, ah, oh, you whiny woman here, here's some Xanax, relax. But now because women are becoming cardiologists, they're taking those symptoms seriously and they're checking women for coronary artery disease. And just so you know, after menopause, the risk for heart disease in men and women is identical. Estrogen is protective. There's no two ways about it. Estrogen does a couple of things. One, it increases HDL. That is protective. And two, estrogen is a potent arterial vasodilator. And it works, just real quick, this is the artery wall. And you actually have estrogen receptors in your artery wall. So when estrogen binds there, it produces a substance called nitri uh, nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a potent arterial vasodilator. Now, here's the question I have for you. Watch. What, where, do you, where have you heard of nitric oxide? And? If you go to the dentist, what is it called? Laughing. Laughing gas. So when a woman is having her period, she's got a lot of this circulating. Why ain't she happy? I just debunked that myth with science. They should be happy. They should be giggling. Them Duke boys got my money. Say yeah. Just so you know, haters are my motivators. <laughs> so watch. Watch. If somebody can't run on a treadmill because they don't have no legs, like they're a diabetic, then what they do is they give them a drug that stimulates or mimics the sympathetic nervous system. And they give you a drug called dobutamine. Have you heard of it? There you go. So that increases their heart rate and blood pressure, and they're not moving, but their sympathetic nervous system is stimulated, and that will reveal coronary artery disease as well. Say so yeah. Now watch, watch. If you have coronary artery disease, what do you do? Well, you call a friend, call a cop. What they'll do is this. They can do a percutaneous transluminal coronary angioplasty. Oh! They stick a, a guide wire into the femoral artery. They uh, thread it through the aorta and then into the coronary arteries and they find the plaque. And when they find the plaque, Right, they thread it, there's a balloon on the end, and then they inflate that balloon and smash the plaque into the wall of the coronary artery, opening up the artery. Just so you know, arteries are made of muscle and they don't like to get messed with. So when you jack with an artery, it tends to spasm. So to prevent that artery from spasming and closing off, they now usually put what's called a stent in there. And it's just to reinforce it so it doesn't collapse. So this is a percutaneous transluminal coronary angioplasty with stent. So it, you've heard of stents? Yeah. yeah. And it looks like a little, uh, little wire thing on a pen. Yeah. And then that stent actually stays in there. 
And that stent is actually coated with an anticoagulant to prevent blood clots from forming. And then they remove it, and then it stays in there and keeps that artery open. Does it have to be flexible at all, though? No. So no. how does it then change the diameter of that artery for the different pressures? Does that part just automatically stay like this? It just stays like that. Okay. It just stays like that. It, that's, that's what it does. But watch, the pressure in the coronary artery doesn't change that much. And the reason it doesn't, because diastolic pressure doesn't necessarily change that much. And the diastolic pressure is what perfuses the coronary arteries. Now, watch. <clears throat> if they can't do that, then what they'll do is they will do a um, bypass surgery. So watch. So this doesn't show it that great, but watch. Let's say, for example, that you have a cholesterol blockage here. What they will do is they will take a vein, and they will cut a hole here, and then cut a hole here, and then connect the vein, bypassing the plaque. And because blood always takes the path of least resistance, mm -hmm. the vein has less resistance than the blockage, so that arterial blood will travel through that vein. That's how they do bypass surgery. Uh, they have a newer thing now where they have a laser, and they will take this and guide it, and they will use the laser to obliterate plaque. The problem is, is that they, the laser doesn't know when to stop. So they've been working this with animals, and what it does is burns a hole right through the coronary artery. So once they perfect that, they'll start working on people with it. So I figure next week, maybe. That's, uh, that's bypass. Um, you follow that? Yeah. Can I just show you one more thing? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, have you heard of the uh, left ventricular assist device? Uh, the Jarvik? The artificial heart? Have yeah. you heard of that? Yeah. Anyways, before they had the Jarvik, what they would do for people who had a really bad um, left ventricle is, um, hang on, I gotta show you. This is what they would do for these people. Come on, God. You know, making these videos is it's very difficult, you know? And no one cares, right? Who cares, anybody? No, you don't. Ah, uh, yeah, whatever. No, no, don't even show it. There you go. What the hell is this? Baby registry? <laughs> it just keeps getting better. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Okay, watch. In people who have a really bad jacked up left ventricle, what they would do is they would actually remove part of their lat muscle, and they would take that lat muscle, and they would wrap it, around the damaged left ventricle. Then they would put a pacer wire in the lat muscle and a pacer wire in the right ventricle and they would pace the heart so when the left and right ventricle were contracting, that lat muscle that was wrapped around the ventricle would contract at the same time. And they used that as a bridge to transplant until they could find a heart transplant for that person. And that works the same as heart muscle? No. No. Not that. Right, but there's nothing you can do about it, right? What are you going to do? You got to wait for a, you got to wait for a heart. You know, and people are kind of reluctant, especially if they're alive, to donate the heart. I'm just saying. All right. Did I answer uh, th uh, those questions? I answered number six or number five, right? Okay. Well, uh, what's left? Nine. What's nine? Cardiac output? I'm going to knock that out in two seconds. You got to pee? That's because you just have to go. When you got to go, you got to go. You know?
That's number 10. If you write that, I'll give you credit. Okay, watch. Here we go. I'm explaining cardiac output. You know what's a ripoff? Sweetest day in Valentine's Day. That's just a ripoff. What is going on? You know it's a big holiday now? Halloween. It's like big, like people are spending like a ton of money on that. I'm going to go to a Halloween party as a technical college instructor. Okay, here we go. Okay, ready? Ready? How much blood does the heart pump each minute? Five liters, and that is 5,000 cc's per minute. Five, yep, thank you. Cc's per minute. You got me? Do we pump all 5,000 cc's at once? No. no. We pump a little bit over that entire minute. So watch. When the SA node fires, it's going to cause the ventricles to contract. The number of times that the SA node fires and causes the ventricles to contract is called your heart rate. So when you take a patient's heart rate, what you're actually measuring is the number of times the SA node fires and causes your left ventricle to contract. Now, when the left ventricle contracts, it pushes out a certain amount of blood with each beat. Are you following this? The amount of blood ejected with each beat of the left ventricle is called your stroke volume. So stroke volume is the amount of blood ejected with each beat of the left ventricle. How many people got that? So to determine cardiac output, you take your heart rate times your stroke volume. Are you with me? So you pump out approximately 5,000 cc's per minute. And that is equal to what's the normal heart rate at rest? 60 to 80. So we'll take the median point, and that's 70. So 70 beats per minute. And the left ventricle ejects about 70 cc's per beat. You got me? The beats cancel out using the factor cancellation method. Yeah? And you come out with approximately or exactly 4,900 cc's per minute or 5,000 cc's per minute. So that is cardiac output. Cardiac output is determined by the number of times the left ventricle contracts times the amount of blood that's ejected with each beat of your heart. Are you following that? Did I explain to you Starling's Law of the Heart? Yeah. I did. So watch. Watch. How do you know that your heart is pumping more blood? What's an easy way to know that? Your heart rate goes up. In the normal physiology, if your heart rate's going up, you are pumping more blood. So what we do to increase the amount of blood that the heart pumps per minute, we do both. We increase our heart rate and... Our stroke volume. So watch. Watch. I'm going to ambulate home. So I start running. You follow? When I run, I have to contract muscle. And when I contract muscle, it squishes my veins more. And when I squish my veins more, what happens to venous return to the right side of the heart? And when I add more blood back to the right side of the heart, I stretch the heart. Mm -hmm. And when I stretch the heart, it contracts harder with more force. And that increases the amount of blood that's ejected with each beat of the heart. Mm -hmm. Isn't that right? Uh -huh. So now, the amount of blood pumped by the right heart is 
now equal to the amount of blood pump on the left heart. Mm -hmm. So if I add more blood to the left heart, I'm going to stretch it. It's going to be a greater force of contraction, greater pressure, and more blood ejected with each beat. Yes. So by contracting muscle, that's how you increase your stroke volume. Mm -hmm. Say yes. Yes. Exercise stressful? <laughs> what do you mean? Yeah. That's a yes, right? Anybody ever, like, most guys die of a heart attack playing sports, right? They don't die sitting in a chair drinking a beer. Write that down. So, because your exercise is stressful, the sympathetic nervous system kicks in, that cranks up your heart rate, and the venous return by contracting your muscles increases your stroke volume. Say yes. That works. Watch. Now watch. All of these things relate. Here's looking up your old address. What's water made out of? Wait, what's blood made out of? Water. <laughs> Blood's made out of water. So if I if I take in water, what's going to happen to my blood volume? It's going to go up. And if I increase my blood volume, what's going to happen to venous return to the right side of the heart? Venous return increases. And if I add more blood to the right side of the heart, what do I do physically to the heart? I stretch it. When I stretch the right heart, it contracts harder. It pumps out more blood per beat, and the blood that's being pumped is under higher pressure. Ain't that right? So all of that deoxygenated blood goes to the lungs and gets oxygenated, and now there's more blood coming back to the left heart. What do you do to the left heart? When you stretch it, that increases the force of contraction, the amount of blood ejected with each beat, and the pressure with which that blood is ejected. When your blood pressure goes up, where does it go up? Everywhere. Everywhere, including your kidneys. And any time you increase pressure in your kidneys, it forces your kidneys to make more urine. That's called pressure... Diuresis. Yeah. <laughs> Say yes. Yes, sir. That's why when you wake up in the morning, even though you haven't had anything to drink all night, and you've been drooling on your pillowcase, you, you have to pee. That's because when you lay down, all that venous blood that was stored in your legs during the day comes back to your heart. Stretch. So if you have, like your husband, if they pee the bed, then what you do is you strap them to the bed and have them sleep upright. <laughs> Just write that down. When I was in college, I came home drunk, and I thought <laughs> the bathroom was the bathroom, and it really was my buddy's room, and I'm peeing all over him. I'm like up against the wall like this, and I'm just <laughs> Yeah, a little urine never comes to be free and friend, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, he vomited at me one time, right on the leg. How many people followed that? You got that? Yes. Um, what other questions we got to go over? Number 14. What is it? No, part of number 11. What's number 11? Why people faint and sit. Yeah, well, who knows? Watch. I can do that and then you can ambulate home. Watch. Any pressure in the veins? No. Gravity, by gravity, all that venous blood is going to be sequestered in your leg by gravity, right? And what do people do when they stand for a long period of time? They lock their legs. And when you lock your legs, you're not contracting your muscle. So what's going to happen to venous return to the right side of the heart? If there's less venous return, the right side of the heart stretched less. So what's going to happen to the force of contraction, the amount of blood ejected with each beat, the pressure with which that blood is ejected? And now you're sending less blood to the lungs. That means less blood on the left side, less stretch of the left heart, less force of contraction, less blood flow to the brain, and under less pressure. And if you can't maintain blood flow to your brain, you pass out. Mm -hmm. What are you supposed to do? Lift the left leg. 
If you lift their legs up by gravity, that venous blood comes back to the right heart, stretch, boom, 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 you can, you can complete the rest, yes? Yes, sir. So if somebody passes out and you don't like them, you drag them to a corner and drop them up. <laughs> Write that down. Okay, you can ambulate home. I'll have uh, I'll have the videos up. I've, I've got the videos on the, the heart. I've got the one internal part to the heart already posted. I have to download the external parts. Say yes. Okay.